telling you, this guy is like so quiet. He ne doesn't tell you the things he does. He just does them. Clearly, we haven't heard the half of it. I'm actually surprised that the people at uh, uh, USC worked it out. I think he's going to be seriously embarrassed by this event. I think it'll be fabulous. <laughs>
Skid Row Housing Trust was born from that activity, and they've done a number of SRO hotels on Skid Row. But we also saw 10 years ago just the whole adaptive reuse industry in downtown Los Angeles and converting old office buildings into lofts. So that's another example of the work that was done under Jim's leadership that was way ahead of its time, but there it is now. Jim's a fine, fine designer. Dworsky's office was known for a really great design. On the, on the Federal Reserve project, uh, Jim was the lead designer, but he also created a great atmosphere for the designers working on the project. He fostered designers being designers. He was very good at being able to, to help not only support our efforts, but to be able to translate those and be able to sell really good architectural ideas to, to the client. Jim is a, he's a planner. He thinks about big ideas, but at the other end of the spectrum, he loves the details. He loves the way buildings are put together. After leaving Dworsky and moving to Archiplan, he was able to bridge both worlds. Jim could be working on Bugle Boy, at the same time, we could be working on uh, projects on Skid Row and things for LA Community Design Center or other nonprofits. The Prentice Hotel was, uh, was the first project where we really looked at communal kitchens and kind of community space, a social spine within the project uh, where people are seeing each other and hanging out. So there was kind of a shared value system amongst the principals there. They were all Peace Corps people. Uh, but they had always kind of been in touch with Jim, and I think, you know, when Jim left Dworsky, it was kind of a natural uh, pairing for them to get together. So we're talking about the 80s and the 90s. Each time he did a project, he raised the bar of what was acceptable in terms of resources and design thoughtfulness. Uh, Covidium was, it was one of those great experiences that people sometimes have in their careers where a group of like-minded people come together and really click. The work that was mostly low income and special needs housing, that actually led us into doing historic preservation work because a lot of the work was renovating older buildings in, in downtown Los Angeles and, and Skid Row. Architecture and design was something that nonprofits weren't always doing but I think Jim was kind of at the front of seeing that design could have an impact. This building was known as Dracula's Castle, and they just did a wonderful job of having a vision of what this building could look like and providing uh, affordable housing for low-income people, but at the same time preserving and pr protecting the historic nature of the property. Both the Young Apartments and really any other building that that Jim was involved in designing that was low-income housing, it doesn't look like low-income housing. And, and that was something that Jim has always felt very strongly about. I think someone who was living up in Bunker Hill had contacted the owner of the building asking if, if he could rent the penthouse apartment. And I think their response to him was, do you earn less than $17,000 a year? Jim left private practice to be the executive director of Skiro Housing Trust. Now he's working on the side of being the owner and the client and worrying about all the other parts of the puzzle, like how to finance it, how to operate and manage the housing over, you know, 30 years. And by the time he had left, there were significant projects in the pipeline, all by you know, noted designers whose work was being published, and uh, they've been the model for a lot of other nonprofits. They were helping educate the community. This is good design, and it's on Skid Row. The, the Abbey opened a couple of years ago, the largest uh, supportive services project, the new model of doing supportive service housing. Jim's continued involvement in the affordable housing world from the developer aspect continues to be really critical. He is a thought leader in the industry and 
he's very innovative in how he approaches his, his developments. So I can see that reflected in the work that Skid Row Housing Trust did under his tenure and continues to be reflected in the work that Clifford Beard does. I was really happy when Clifford Beers was selected because of their top-notch reputation and working with people who are suffering from mental illness and helping them on to a path towards recovery. With the Y, you had this beautiful building by a really well-known architect who represents an extraordinary achievement in his time to be an African-American architect that early with that credibility. Paul Williams is a USC graduate. I think it's really great that a USC graduate is bringing it back to life in Jim Bonner. The architect in him still comes out, so Jim had sent me, um, Brian, I, here's a, a little quick overlay I had done on the plans. Was he said, I have a building that has 52 units in it. They're very tiny little eight by 10 rooms. But what I need to do is the supportive services model and I need to have units that have bathrooms and kitchens. Because I need to basically take two units. If I knock out half the units here, I should be able to build on the little sliver of the land a new building in the back. That's a very savvy kind of thing. He said it has to be just as good as the one up in the front. So he hired us and we went about designing the project. We were standing together at the uh, groundbreaking. You know, we both got a little teary-eyed, you know. When you do projects like that, that are really going to make a difference. Architecture has been misconceived as an enterprise that is only made possible with excessive wealth or expenditure, which in a way has disabled us uh, to excel to a more intelligent engagement to the world. So I do think the design with humanity at the core actually engenders even more intelligence because you have limited resource and you have a tremendous limitation in it. I think Jim really achieved a lot in that kind of narrow parameters. Uh, remarkable. It seems like just within the most pragmatic terms, whether they're social, cultural, economic, that um, we're not on a sustainable path as a society, and it has to change. It's going to change, um, it's going to change having to do with architecture as a social act and, and, and as something more inclusive of society. And, and, and Jim is, is all about inclusive. <laughs> that's, that's what he's about, right? And leveling the playing field as much as one character can do it. Need more Jim Bonners. Not too many people involved in that kind of territory. Right? It's not just a profession. It's not what he does, it's who he is. Jim Bonner is a man who has advanced a cause and created an enormous amount of change. But let's not kid ourselves. There's still a lot of work to be done. I, I'm keenly aware of that and I know that Jim is aware of it. And so he's just one man. And I hope that it will inspire you to go out there and participate in whatever way you can, but to take the energy that Jim has created and to use that in some way to fulfill your own life. Uh, Jim's career is emblematic of a biblical phrase, um, justice, justice, you shall pursue. I think it so fits Jim, and he's still in that same pursuit, the pursuit of social justice.